many of our people do not realize how firmly the foundation of our faith has been laid. Light was given that helped us to understand the scriptures in regard to Christ, His mission, and His priesthood. A line of truth extending from 1844 to the time when we shall enter the city of God was made plain. I want to tell you this morning a story, a story about myself and a story about a journey that uh, I have been on, or at least I was on. In 2009, uh, I started studying about the Holy Spirit, and I wasn't studying necessarily about the identity of the Holy Spirit like I understand now, but uh, I was studying about the work of the Holy Spirit. And as I started studying about the work of the Holy Spirit, my understanding of the Holy Spirit developed, but then it went too far, and I accidentally became a pantheist. So that's the name of my message this morning. I'm going to tell you the story about how I accidentally became a pantheist. Well, it started with my understanding of grace my understanding of grace. Now, I, did, I grew up in a mainstream, mainline, if you want to call it Protestant, denomination. It wasn't really even a denomination. I guess you can say I grew up as an evangelical Christian. And the mainstream, I would say, idea about grace is that grace is, do you know, God's unmerited favor. Have you heard that before? Grace is God's unmerited favor. Now, there's definitely uh, something to that, but I don't believe that it paints a full picture of God's grace. But it basically goes like this. Grace is something that we don't deserve. It's God's attitude towards us. It's something that happens in the heart of God where He now looks upon you and I favorably. That, according to many, is God's grace, and that's where I started my journey. I came across a verse uh, in 2 Peter chapter 3. I came across a verse, and in my mind, it did not line up with what I understood about grace. And I wanted to find out, well, what does the Bible actually say uh, about grace? So 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And the thought occurred to me, if we're to grow in grace, and grace is unmerited favor, that just didn't make sense to me at all. And maybe I'm a, a simple-minded, maybe I just think very, uh, very simply, but to grow in grace would be to grow in unmerited favor. Well, if grace is unmerited favor, it's unmerited. <laughs> I mean, can you grow in unmerit? <laughs> uh, do you see where I'm coming from? So to me, it was like, well, grace has to be something more. I mean, there may be an element of truth that it's God's turning or his favor towards me, his attitude toward me. But here, if we're to grow in grace, uh, it must be something more. And right there, it does say that grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Son of God. And so grace, in my mind, at least it made sense to me, it's got to be something more. So I kept digging, and I came across a verse in Acts. What I did was I looked up my concordance or got my concordance. Now, back in those days, uh, we didn't have smartphones. It's amazing how just all of a sudden the technology blew up, and now I just have a concordance and all these books, and I can do all this research right on my phone. And, but back in those days, I actually had to get a concordance, you know, that big, thick book, and I got to go down and look up grace and go open up my Bible and look up every verse. And so that's what I did. And I came across this verse in Acts chapter 4, verse 33, speaking about grace. And what is grace? Talking about the disciples and the early church and those who were gathered together uh, in the church at that time, it says, With great power, 
gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great what? Was upon them all. So with great power, the apostles gave witness, great grace was upon them. There I saw what we would label as a parallel or parallelism. That great power equals great grace or great grace equals great power. And so in my mind, grace went from something that occurs in the heart of God primarily to something that God does in my heart. Are you with me? That grace is something that is given to me that changes my heart. And I started to get excited. I thought, wow, that's really, that's really neat. That really hits home for me. That makes it really personal. God's grace is given to me. It's something real. It's something tangible. It's not merely a, a, an attitude. It's a living, vital principle that God has given to the believer. And so I kept on digging, and I found... Paul wrote about uh, grace in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. That grace is God's power to me, personally. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and verse 9, it says... He said unto me, now that's Jesus, this is Jesus speaking to Paul. My grace, my what? My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. So here Paul is, Paul is, in the context, Paul is struggling with a physical weakness. And that causes him pain and turmoil and anguish. And he's crying out to the Lord. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Do you see the parallel again? My grace or my strength is made perfect in what? Weakness. My grace or strength is made perfect in weakness. So what was Paul's response? So here Jesus speaks to him. And, and he says, my, my grace is sufficient. My, my, my strength is, is, is enough for your weakness. And Paul, thinking about it, he says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. He says, praise God that I have infirmities. Because the power of Christ, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, do we look at it that way? Do we look at it the, as uh, we have technical difficulties or we have trials or temptations or we go through experiences in life that we struggle and we ask God why? Well, here's the question why. Here's the answer to the question why. Because when we have infirmities, that's an opportunity for God to give us what? Great grace, great strength. In what? In weakness, in weakness. So great, or the grace of Christ is his strength, his power for his weakness, Paul's weakness. So does anybody feel weak this morning? <laughs> Do you feel powerless? Do you feel helpless? He boasted in his weakness. Now, this principle is completely opposite. And I, and I just, I sometimes, brethren, sisters, I marvel that we have not understood this. This principle. Because what is uh, in the carnal heart of man, and we look all to the world around us, what is it that men do? I mean, come on now. I worked in construction. I was a, uh, I was a, a concrete man. Now, concrete, I mean, that's a, a pretty rough, tough job, and, and you got to be a pretty macho kind of guy to, to day in, day out, go and work in concrete, go work in construction. I mean, it takes a, a man to do that job, right? <laughs> what do you expect the environment was like there while I was working in construction? What do you, what do you think that environment is like? Now, does anybody in here do construction? 
I do. I've worked with it, and, and some of them get pretty proud. Pretty proud, they get to talk right? Song and pretty soon they're fighting and proud, right. macho, aggressive, arrogant, arrogant. domineering. domineering. <laughs> okay, you guys know. <laughs> you guys did better than I expected. <laughs> right, what was that? Proud, absolutely, absolutely. But what does Paul say? What is the Christian's response? Paul says, I will boast in my weakness that the power of Christ would come upon me. So what does the carnal heart say? The unconverted person say? They boast about their accomplishments. They boast about their own power. They boast about their own strength. They boast about what they've overcome. They boast about their power to make the right decisions. They boast about their Sabbath keeping. They boast about their uh, whatever you want to name it. It is for you. About I stopped doing this or I stopped doing That's what we boast about. Now, now Christ will help us do all of those things, do all the right things, right? But sometimes we boast in our own strength. But Paul says right here, what are we to boast upon? Our weakness, our weakness, that goes opposite. It's completely opposite of what we naturally possess. It goes completely opposite of the world. I think we should start learning to boast in our weaknesses and understanding our true condition, our helplessness, because that's when the power of Christ will come upon us. Is that right? Is that right? When we humble, if you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, he will lift you up. We humble ourselves and say, hey, look, I'm weak. Don't look to me. <laughs> Paul said, boast, I boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ would come upon me. That's my point. And I think that's Paul's point right here, uh, that we receive grace. We receive the power uh, of Christ when we boast in our weakness and we realize our need our need of the power of, uh, of God that comes to us through Christ. So now turn with me to another verse. So the question is, well, if grace is power or Christ's strength, how do we receive that power? How is it that we receive that strength? Now I'm talking about and telling you a story about how I became accidentally a pantheist. <laughs> and we're going to get there, but I'm showing you step by step kind of what was being revealed to me as I was studying. So how is it that we receive the power, the life of God? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, it says, But you shall, now this is Christ speaking again, but you shall receive power. You shall receive what? Power. Now, if you compare that with Acts 4.33, it says that great grace was upon them with great power, right? Christ predicted that. He says, great power will come upon you. Later on, it says they had great power and great grace. But what was that great power? What was that great grace that came upon them? You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. The Holy Spirit is come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in all Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, does Christ want us to be his witnesses? Now, we have the truth about who Jesus Christ is. Is that right? We understand that Jesus is the Son of God. Of all the people in the world, he wants you to be his witnesses because, frankly, there's not a lot of us. <laughs> there's not a lot of us. And so we all need to be his witnesses. You can go grab a, a DVD, a final protest DVD, and hand it out or send a link to somebody. But before we do any of that, we need to understand the principle here. Before we're his witnesses, we need to receive something. What is it? After the Holy Ghost, power. We need to receive his power. We need to receive his grace. We need to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in my life, in your life. Then we can be his witnesses. You know, sometimes we try to witness without the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever done that? What do we make? A mess. We make a mess. And we offend people. 
and, and we turn them away? Brothers and sisters, we need to receive the Spirit of Christ, and in the Spirit of Christ, go to our brethren. Humbly, realizing our own weaknesses, realizing our need of the grace of Christ, then we will be his witnesses. And that's, my, uh, that's my, uh, the gist of my uh, message right here that, uh, that we're getting across. Grace is the power of Christ, which comes to us when we receive the Holy Spirit. Now, how much of this grace does Christ want to give us? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Grace is the power, that power comes upon us when we receive the Holy Spirit. But how much? How much? Just a little bit? <laughs> a little drop? <laughs> Are we satisfied with just a, just a little tiny inkling? How much is Christ waiting? How much of His grace is He waiting to pour out upon you and I? How much of His power? Well, let's read about it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. I love this verse. I love it. <laughs> but every, unto every one of us, and that includes us too, every one of us is given what? Grace, Grace which is his power, which comes to us through the Spirit. Every one of us is given grace according to the Measure of the gift of who? Whew. Do you understand what you just read? Okay, so uh, how much is Christ worth? If you can measure, when God gave his son, how much did he give? Everything. He gave it all. He gave it all. How do you measure that? You can't. You can't measure it. It's without measure. That's the point. It's according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Well, what is the measure of the gift of Christ? It's immeasurable. Unlimited. And he says to every one of us. Do we realize what's available? <laughs> How do we receive it? Do we understand that we're going about in the Christian life, the Christian experience, and we're boasting about the wrong thing? When we should be boasting about our weaknesses and realize our need, and that's then, that's when we receive the power of Christ? Unlimited? I don't know about you, but... Brothers and sisters, <laughs> how long? How long are we going to go about in the condition that we're in? And I'm talking about myself. <laughs> I'm talking about myself. I, I feel it. I know it. I sense it. I see it. Our condition. And that's not a judgment against you or against anybody. Because I'm included there. And I just, we're, we're going through life. And, and we've, praise God, we've accepted the truth about the Father and the Son. And, and I mean, praise God for that. Let's keep going. Let's receive the power of Christ. Let's humbly submit and, and, and admit our weaknesses. Confess our problems. Confess our faults. Confess our weaknesses. Openly. That's how we receive the power of Christ. And I'll share some testimonies this afternoon about that. Um, I've seen some incredible things, brothers and sisters. I mean, miracles. I've asked for miracles, and I've seen miracles within the last two years. I've seen the Spirit of God come upon people and the hearts of people and do incredible things like that. And I can't explain it other than it's the power of Christ. And once you see it, and brothers and sisters, you want to keep seeing it and you want it more. I don't know. We have unlimited grace available, <laughs> available to us.
Unlimited power and unlimited spirit. He's waiting. Christ is waiting for his people to acknowledge our condition and to knowledge (laughs) and confess and say, yes, Lord, I I am weak. Well, verse 8, Ephesians 8, it says, Wherefore he sitteth, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Now that he that ascended, what is it but he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Now, obviously, this is speaking about Christ, the one who ascended or was resurrection, but first resurrected, but first he descended into the earth. He was buried, then he was resurrected and went up to heaven. Verse 10, he that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens that he might do what? Fill all things. So Christ, why did he go to heaven? So he could fill all things. He could fill his church. He could fill his people. With what? Grace. His power. His spirit. He descended. He died and was buried and ascended into heaven on the right hand of God. So he could fill you. And you can experience a power that you do not possess. In your own strength. That's the whole point. That's why he did what he did. So he could fill you and me. Now, it was around that time that I read in uh, the book Steps to Christ. One of my favorite books. Page 52. It says, they must have his grace, the spirit of Christ, to help their infirmities or they cannot resist evil. I was reading that and I said, they must have his grace. I was studying about grace. They must have his grace the Spirit of Christ. Like the grace, the Spirit of Christ. Well, that's what I was reading in my Bible. I said, wow, that is powerful. That is really neat. So Ephesians chapter 4, he fills all things. Verse 11, what does he fill them with? He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. See, we have the knowledge of the Son of God. Are we in the unity of the faith? (laughs) But do we have the knowledge of the Son of God? Well, I would recommend go watching a a video that I did last week. Uh, It was, Is the Godhead Truth a Salvational Issue? And... uh, It asks the questions, well, do we really know God in Christ? As he is speaking about in John 17, 3. So, do we have unity, the unity of the faith? Well, like I said, I'm I'm a simple-minded individual. It says here that the gifts of the Spirit are for the perfecting of the saints and to bring everybody into unity. Well, if we're not in unity, what do we need? (laughs) What do we need? (laughs) Right here, we need grace. It says we need him to give us the gifts. But how do we get the gifts? We got to be willing to humble ourselves and say, I am am weak. We need to boast in our infirmities. That's that's the the step in order to receive that power power. Uh, or grace, and he pours out his spirit, the gifts of the spirit, and that is what brings us into unity. So, if we're not into unity, I don't know. I see that as being one of the solutions. Now, I started comparing uh, and looking at the idea of the gift of God, the gift of God, and I came across uh, a couple of verses: Matthew chapter seven, verse eleven. And Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Matthew 7, 11, and Luke chapter 11, verse 13. And Jesus is, basically, it's a record of the same thing, of Jesus saying the same thing, but uh, 
from two different sources. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, it says, If you then, being evil, know how to give what? Good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give what? Good things to them that ask him. If you're evil and you know how to give a good thing to your child or a good gift to your child, do you not think that the Father in heaven can give you a good gift? Well, let's look at Luke chapter 11. Well, what is that good thing? What is that good gift that the Father wants to give us? Luke eleven thirteen. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Are you asking? Are you asking? <laughs> Are you asking in faith? Are you asking in humility? Are you asking for the right reasons? So I found that, uh, well, it says right there that the Holy Spirit is a gift from the Father. It's a gift of God. So I went to a couple of verses. John chapter 4. Should be very familiar to you. John chapter 4, and I want to look at three verses. John 4, 10, Acts chapter 8, 20, and 2 Timothy 1, 6. So John 4, verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the what? Gift of God. Here you have a woman comes to a well, and here is the Son of God, and she doesn't even know it. She doesn't even know what she could receive. She's going about her life, just living it like everybody else, powerless. She comes across the Son of God. She doesn't realize who she's talking to and what he has for her. And it says, if thou knewest the gift of God. I think I like to put it this way. If you only knew. If you only knew the gift of God. And who it was, who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink. Thou would have asked him and he would have given thee what? Living water. Now what is the living water? That's the Holy Spirit. The living water is the Spirit of Christ. And he says, if you only knew the gift of God, I would have given you this Spirit of God. I would have given you the Spirit of God. The living water. Now, Acts chapter 8. The gift of God. And so I started studying how I accidentally became a pantheist. I started studying about grace. And I realized that it's God's power. That comes to us through the Spirit. That the Spirit is the gift of God. A good gift. In Acts chapter 8, verse 20, it says, But Peter said unto him, that is to Simon Magus, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Can the gift of God be purchased with money? Can we purchase the living water with money? <laughs> no, we cannot. We don't purchase it. It's a gift. <laughs> I guess we got to give them ourselves first. Give him our wills, then we can receive it. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Looking at the gift of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. And I started to look at all these verses in a, in, a, in a very different way. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance. This is Paul speaking to Timothy, his advice. I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee. So the gift of God is in thee. How? By thee putting on of my hands. So Paul put his hands upon him and he received what? The Holy Spirit. 
Paul calls it the gift of God. Now, the word right here says to stir up. Uh, I think if you go to the original language, it's, uh, it's, it's like fan the flame. You've got to fan the flame of the Holy Spirit. He says stir up the gift of God. And so I was starting to look at the scriptures in a different way. Have you ever experienced that before? Where you start studying and you thought you knew the scriptures? And you start studying and you see it in a completely different light? That's happened to me on multiple occasions. Well, I saw one well, I mean, a main verse, very well-known verse, in a completely different light. When I studied grace, when I studied God's power, the Holy Spirit, the gift of God. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, For by what? Grace. Are you saved through? Faith. And that, not of yourselves, it is the? It's the gift of God. <laughs> it's the gift of God, brothers and sisters. <laughs> uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. So I really had to think about it. See, God was changing my view about what grace was. That it's His power that comes to me through the Holy Spirit. And I thought I knew this verse. I mean, basically, I, I understood it this way, probably how most people understand it, that, look, I receive salvation when I simply just believe that Jesus uh, existed, that he's the Son of God, he died for me. Uh, I just believe that. I take it by faith. Um, and his grace uh, is upon me. You know, he changes his attitude towards me. And, uh, I, but I saw it differently now. It says, we're saved by grace, through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And so I asked myself a question. What is it referring to? Grace? So, okay, well, yeah, I mean, I've already seen that. That's a gift. What about faith? It's the whole thing. The whole thing. You are saved by grace through faith. It's the gift of God. Not of yourselves, lest you think you could boast about yourself. And that's why Paul says, I boast about my infirmities, because it's the power of Christ, it's the work of Christ, it's the Spirit of Christ. And so it made me think, okay, well, is faith also a gift? Is faith also a gift? Or is it something that I exercise myself? Hopefully this will become a little bit clearer. I found Galatians chapter 5. Because I, I, I connected grace with the Holy Spirit. Well, is faith connected with the Holy Spirit as well? Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. So what is faith, brothers and sisters? <laughs> the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Grace is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The results. Now, if you look at what, uh, what he's doing here, he says, but the fruit. What is he comparing that to? Well, if you back up, uh, uh, in verse 17 of chapter 5, it says, the flesh less against the flesh. He's, com he's comparing the, the flesh with the spirit or the work, uh, the spirit. Now, uh, in verse 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh. So he says, the works of the flesh are these. And then he lists a bunch of lists. And then in verse 22, he says, But, here's the work of the flesh. And he says, But, here's the fruit or the work of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, 
meekness and temperance, against such there is no law. The work of the Spirit of Christ are all of these things. That's the work of the Spirit of Christ in us. I'm like, oh man, that's a, that's a radical, con- I, I'd never even thought about that before. That the whole process of salvation is, is, is a gift. It's, it's the work of Christ in me and to me. And it's, it's, it's him drawing me to himself. And that when I receive him, he's the one that does the works in me through the Holy Spirit. Like, wow, this is incredible stuff. And I had to think for a second. Well, the faith, faith. Okay, the faith is not mine, obviously, because it's a fruit of the Spirit. So when I receive the Spirit, I receive this, this fruit or the work or the gift called faith. Well, if it's not my faith, whose faith is it? <laughs> whose faith is it? Of course, I had in my mind a verse, a well-known verse. <laughs> I saw it on a license plate out here. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So the work of faith, faith, it says it is the gift of God. Faith is the work or the fruit of the Spirit. So it's not my faith. Whose faith is it? It's the faith of Jesus. It's the faith of Christ. It's Christ working in me to save me and you, brothers and sisters. And what does he want us to do? To boast in our infirmities. Humble ourselves and say, yes, Lord, (laughs) you're right. I'm, I'm miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Those are the people he saves. Those are the people he saves and he can work with. I also think of Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says, one of my favorite verses, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So the faith of Jesus, the faith of of the Son of God, working in me. And it's like, this was a powerful experience, brothers and sisters. Like, wow, this is, this is awesome stuff. This is really, I mean, kind of practical stuff. And so then I went and looked at the word uh, faith. What is it? Uh, the word in the Greek is pist- pistis. And it's basically this, a conviction of the truth of anything or a belief. So I'm like, wow, conviction. Hmm. Because I just saw that it's the work or the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Well, what is that work? Well, what is faith? What is the definition of faith? Conviction. (laughs) Conviction. And I actually went back and read Hebrews chapter 11 with that understanding in mind and understood and looked at it in a different way that the Holy Spirit was working in these people all throughout the Old Testament to convict them. And they responded to the work of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ in them. They responded to that conviction. So faith is the fruit or the works of the Spirit in my heart, in your heart. It's a conviction of truth. It's a conviction of belief. It's a a conviction of duty. Uh, It's a conviction of sin. That's the work of Christ. That's faith. Faith is something, I mean, and I've experienced at times in my life, and I'm going to share a little bit this afternoon, that the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, speaks to me, and and I'm like, is that really you, Lord? Is that... (laughs) And as I've responded, I've seen some incredible things. And, and I've just, after they've happened, I, I just step back and like, where did that come from? So I didn't produce that. And I think about the woman that had an issue of blood. And in Matthew, I believe it's Matthew chapter 9, 
there's, there's a phrase. She, she heard about Christ. She saw the crowd. And there's a thought that came to her mind. It says, she said within herself, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I may be made whole. And I stopped to think about that for a minute. She said within herself, where did that thought come from? Where did that thought come from? That was, was that from the flesh? <laughs> Does the flesh draw us to Christ? That thought was a gift planted upon her heart and her mind. If I, buy, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be made whole. And she responded to the working of the Spirit of God in her heart. And that's how it works, brothers and sisters. That's how it works. Christ is waiting to work <laughs> in an immeasurable way. Don't resist. Don't resist. That's the message. Don't not resist the working of Christ. Well, I started to understand the, the work of the Holy Spirit and faith and, and grace and salvation. And I asked myself, well, what is there? What, what else do I don't know about uh, the work of the Holy Spirit? And uh, I started studying and... I went too far, and that's when I became an accidental pantheist. <laughs> Turn with me to Job. Job chapter 27. Job chapter 27. Uh, Job. Yeah, Job. And uh, wrapping up here, uh, how I became an accidental pantheist. Job chapter 7, now it's going to, the message is going to take a little bit of a turn. I'm telling a story, and I pray that uh, what we shared so far was a blessing to you. Uh, we're going to switch things up a little bit here, and uh, hit, uh, at least share a little bit of my experience. It says, Job chapter 7, 27, and verse 3, All the while the breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Job chapter 33. So now we're going to get, uh, that was a little bit more practical. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more doctrinal here. Job chapter 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath all of the Almighty hath given me life. Now I understood, we, look at those two verses. The breath of the Almighty hath given me life, or the Spirit, breath, Spirit. Uh, and uh, Job 27, verse 3, that uh, the breath... The Spirit of God is in my nostrils. I read those, and I understood that uh, from my, un my study of the state of the dead, that the word ruach means what? Spirit or breath or breath. And um, I started to think about that, about the breath or the breath of life. And Job right here says, my breath is in me, the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. That the breath of the Almighty gives me life. And uh, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 17, it says that everything, every living creature, has the breath of life. All flesh. This is my reasoning. Okay, follow along with me. The breath of life is the Spirit of God. And all things have, all living things or all living creatures have the Spirit of God in them. That's what I read. Now John 6.63, 6, it says, The Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profits nothing, the word that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Now Jesus is the one that spoke the word, and uh, at creation, and the Spirit is the life-giving power that made it happen. I believed it's the Spirit of God that sustained all living things. Or the life of God. And I started to think, okay, well, how does a tree have life? And, and who's, 
where does Lucifer get his life? Where do sinners, where does everybody get their life from? I mean, do they have it in and of themselves? Do all things have life in and of themselves? Where do they get life? <laughs> and what is that life? Well, right here it says the Spirit is life. Are you with me? Are you following along? And that all things have the breath of life, which is the, Job says, the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God hath made me. The breath of the Almighty hath given me life. So the breath or uh, the life of God is given to the whole universe. That's what it says in uh, Desire of Ages, chapter 21. That from Him, life proceeds through Christ. All life is dependent upon God. We don't have it in and of ourselves. It is borrowed. Christ had life that's not borrowed. In fact, our lives are dependent. All life is dependent on a connection with the Father. But sin has severed that connection. So how is it that these things and uh, trees and grass and birds and animals and, and, and humans can have the Spirit of God yet be separated or have the life of God and be separated? And it just maybe was a little bit too, uh, too deep for me to grasp. But... In my understanding how I was in 2009 and 2010, I understood the Spirit of God to be a third being, right? To be a being. Isn't that how most people understand? That the Spirit of God is God the Spirit. God the Spirit. It is a third being in the Godhead or a third being in the Trinity. It's a part of God. It's... it's a manifestation of God. And so that's how I understood it. And so in my mind, it made sense that the Spirit of God is right there, is in His nostrils. Uh, something is giving everything life. Uh, it's clear it has to be the Spirit of God. And so God, the Holy Spirit, is everywhere. So God, the Holy Spirit, the being, is everywhere and in everything, giving life. That's pantheism. <laughs> is it not? <laughs> If you believe the Holy Spirit is a third being. But, praise the Lord, at that time it was, uh, I was still reading and studying and I think I came across uh, maybe a statement or so. or may, I, I can't quite remember, but I think I told somebody and uh, I learned about pantheism. And then I went read and studied about pantheism and, and some of the warnings against pantheism and I thought, well, that, yeah, that can't be right then. My, <laughs> maybe I need to rethink about, you know, what I'm teaching or what I'm, what I'm studying here and what I, what I believed. And so I just, I put that on a shelf. And I left it there. Well, six years later, I come to a different understanding of the Holy Spirit. And now it makes sense. That all life proceeds from God or comes from God and is the Spirit of God, but is not a, not a being. Whether or not you believe uh, it is the Holy Spirit is the means through which Christ comes to us personally, or it is Christ, the person somehow that leaves heaven. And, so, and we can talk about it and discuss about it, but we may not, and we probably won't understand every single detail. We won't. But... We can understand the work of the Spirit upon the human heart, which is that I need a power from what's outside of myself. I need faith to be planted upon my heart. I need the power of Christ upon me in order to produce what I cannot produce. And we get that by humbling ourselves, by humbling ourselves. That's really the heart of this message. So let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for uh, your great love towards us. Thank you for what you've done in my life and revealed uh, a deeper understanding of grace and faith and the work of your spirit. 
Lord, I just pray that most of all, we can experience that work. And we may discuss and share and, and uh, have different ideas uh, and different understandings, but most of all, Father, I just pray that we can receive uh, that deep work of repentance upon our spirit, upon our hearts, and upon our minds. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video from Line of Truth Ministries. You can help get this timely and important video out by liking, sharing, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Also, don't forget to check out our website, lineoftruth.org.